Hello, I'm Dominic Davis, founder of Pink Therapy. We've been training mental health specialists worldwide to work with gender, sex, and relationship diverse clients for many years. This podcast puts the lives of some of these incredible pioneering therapists front and center and gives us insights into what it's like to be LGBTIQA+, or as we prefer, GSRD, speaking in their words. And um, hello, everybody. I'm today joined by Nathan Osborne, who's one of our diploma students. Uh, Nathan, tell us a little bit about yourself, the pronouns and where you are. Yeah. Okay. Hi, thank you for having me on here. Um, so as Dominic said, my name is Nathan Osborne and my pronouns are he, him. Um, I live in Peterborough in England, um, born and bred here, never ventured any further than that, unfortunately. Um, so I consider myself to be trans history, so assigned female at birth, um, mixed race, person of colour. So my dad is an immigrant from Kenya. Um, his parents originated from India and my mum is white British. I'm married and have two cats. Um, <laughs> I have been uh, a therapist since 2016, um, but haven't really gone into practice until about 2018. Um, I sort of did private work alongside uh, employed work at the police. So I work with victims of crime there. Um, and then in December 2020, I decided to uh, be full-time self-employed. And, and left the comfort of the police um, to pursue more GSRD private work. And how has that been for you? Because that must have been a very big move. It was scary considering I did this in the middle of the pandemic. Uh, so right. the, the first right. week of uh, being full-time self-employed, uh, we went into another national lockdown. Uh, so it was quite scary. And I thought, have I done the right thing? Um, but of course I did. I'm still here doing it. Um, I think in some ways COVID has kind of helped that a little bit. Um, so yeah, life changing decision. Um, but it's, it's gone well so far to almost two years on. Mm -hmm. And are you solely online or are you a mixture of online and in person? Yeah. A mixture of online and in person. Mm -hmm. And do you, did you, do you, that sounds like you, you obviously would have chosen to go back to doing some in-person work, whereas I, I, I decided I'll just, I'll close that chapter and it'd stay entirely online. Sure. You like the, you like the in-person contact? I do. Yeah. I do find it, uh, it feels different in person, not, not with everybody, but for some people. Mm -hmm. um and i i didn't decide to go back to in person until i think it was last may and that was a gradual process mm -hmm. it wasn't it wasn't just a, a quick thing it was just some clients who weren't safe to be online that we gradually introduced it and it's just kind of built up from there but there are a lot of people that want to continue to be seen online mm. so it was very much client led and i'm aware that that choice that i made has has meant that some people who might be perhaps in shared accommodation or not have access to a private place to yeah. talk um can't talk so yeah. and yeah i mean it was i also decided i'd stop seeing individual clients or run just wind my practice down on that and just focus on supervision after 40 years so the the choices are a bit different you're beginning sure. yours yeah and and um i'm i'm winding mine down yeah. So is your practice um, very mixed or is it exclusively GSRD? What proportion do you see? I would say um, before doing the pink therapy course, it was probably about 30% GSRD, 70% mm -hmm. everything else. Um, now I would say probably it varies, um, but I would say on average, probably 90% GSRD. Wow. Which is what I want. Uh-huh. Sure. And I think that's the that's the privilege of being able to be a specialist in a field where there's very limited numbers. There's lots of other people to see the, the majority populations, but there aren't that many of us who have got the training 
and the motivation to see to just see our own communities really yeah. uh, and what i also find is that um actually when you really get into depth with some people they mm-hmm. do identify as GSRD in some way, even if, mm-hmm. if it's just really subtly. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's what I've noticed since doing the training. So it's opened my eyes in that way as well. Do you want to give me an example of that without revealing a client, any client details? Sure. So just in terms of perhaps kink, um, you know, when people talk about their relationships and their sex lives, um, I've come to realise that actually most people in some way are GSRD, but perhaps they don't recognise that themselves. Mm. Mm. So yeah. that's been quite interesting. That could be quite a subtle one, can't it, really, as to who, who would identify as being a bit kinky. It's like, oh, well, you're part of our gang, yes. Uh-huh. So, so many people are part of our gang. Yeah, um, and, and actually... Um, a family member, I won't disclose who, but a family member have has uh, recently um, got into swinging, mm-hmm. um, and we have quite in depth conversations about. Actually, you're now part of the queer community, um, <laughs> so, so uh, I'm not I'm not on my own. Um, so yeah, that's been that's been quite eye opening as well. Mm-hmm. Okay, so tell me what what you're working on in particular. At present, in terms of research or projects, what what what's happening outside the therapy room for you? Mm-hmm. So um, obviously, I'm doing the the diploma at the moment, which takes up a lot of time and energy. Um, so, yeah. yeah, a lot. Yeah. <laughs> so, so that is pretty much my main focus outside of therapy work. Um, I also do some work for a local college as well. I deliver group sessions there. Um, but I have started doing a lot of uh, training on trans awareness and also um, unconscious biases and privilege. Mm. Um, so I, I've delivered about five sessions so far this year. And, and actually just yesterday, I delivered my first day session uh, working with trans and gender diverse identities with a group of therapists and mental health professionals. Wow, good. Um, yeah, good. so... Yeah. Uh, was my first one um, so I'm hoping to do much more of that stuff um so and, how did that go tell me about the day how did it go um yeah really interesting it was um you never know how this stuff's going to land particularly uh within a, a city that I'm in it's, it's not very mm. progressive at all so you mm. never quite know how it's going to go but actually a really great bunch of people who took it all on board we had really healthy discussions um and yeah i i think it was a success um good. so yeah hopefully the word will spread and uh, more and more people will want to do stuff like that there's such a need for it i think people really want to know more about working with the trans with trans clients because trans clients are are a, being actively tortured at the moment by our society and so higher numbers are presenting for therapy with with that trauma but wanting to know somewhere safe to go and with we've got sadly amongst our amongst the therapy community quite a few gender critical therapists or at least those who are very ignorant around working with the issues and are hungry for information um sure yeah and i i think that's i think where i live it's once you get people through the door they're open to it but it's getting people through the door here um very much the ignorance what you was talking about i don't need to know about that doesn't Mm. concern me i don't need to know brackets i don't want to know about that exactly yeah yeah exactly so i'm hoping to do more of that kind of stuff um but from that I actually just had a conversation yesterday with somebody and we're going to look at uh getting some community funding to deliver some short cpds on all things queer to therapists within this community where they can access it for free um, and i can sort of spread the word mm. and go about it that way so that's, well, who's going to pay you well that's what the funding comes in for oh that's where you're going to get oh i see yes ah, yeah right okay good so good. uh Hopefully that's gonna that's gonna take off. And I've also been contacted recently um, by a Send School um, in Lincolnshire to ask me to do a comic strip 
um, of my a little bit about my background and my life story to help inform and educate young people, particularly with additional needs, so that they can help. It can help sort of inform them and they can understand gender diversity a little bit better. Cool. That's an interesting side project as well, isn't it? Yeah. It's, yeah. it's like the little ripples go out. And I think it's so good that that you're using your knowledge and skills to deliver training as well, because um, I think the lived experience of being trans is, I, if I go and deliver trans awareness training, I have to do it from a cis perspective. Mm-hmm. And it's very, it's very external. It's very outsider. I know the stuff and I've worked with a lot of trans clients. But I think it comes across with so much more authenticity when a trans person does that training. And that's where it should be. Trans people doing that training mm-hmm. who, who know how, who know the theory, know how the clinical issues can talk from in depth, not just someone who's trans who um, wants, wants uh, uh, to, to do it. I think you need to have some specific knowledge about more than just your lived your own lived experience yeah so i'm really pleased you're you're moving in that direction i think that's going to be a big bonus for everyone thank you um and tell me a little bit about the current well what's what it's like for the for gsrd folk in peterborough because we've got you know therapists dotted around the world peterborough one might think of as being quite i would have thought in some ways quite progressive it's a relatively modern city um is is there a is there a gay bar no is there, the, okay no. not even so no so they used to be they used to be quite a big scene probably 10 to 15 years ago is when it all started to close oh. um and stuff's never just reopened back up there there was a bar um that opened up for a very short time a couple of years ago but it closed down um it just we seem to be going backwards here in peterborough with stuff like that um so although we are a city um you would think yes. quite progressive yes. but we are conservative run make of that what you will um and we are quite we are multicultural we are i think we're, we're one of the uh, most multicultural cities within the uk however what you find is the communities are very segregated. Nobody is, is really integrating with each other. Um, and I think being queer in Peterborough is hard. It's really hard for people because although we're a city, we're surrounded by um, lots of small rural villages mm-hmm. um, with very, very little diversity there. Um, right. So, yeah, it's... Um, so I mean, where do the queers go for support? And for socialising to Cambridge and to London, is that? I hear a lot of my clients do go to London or Manchester uh-huh. uh, for weekends and way nights out, that kind of thing. Um, there are a couple of pubs that people go to, not necessarily queer friendly spaces that they're not sort of targeted for those, but I think people just sort of get comfortable in their local places. Um, but there aren't there aren't any specific places now, unfortunately. Wow. That's that's hard then, because I think we know that meeting one's community, making friends, building a chosen family or having support from people like us is a protective factor against minority stress. Yeah. And then and so if you can't get that near where you live, that must leave people feeling even more vulnerable. I'm wondering if if you're feeling that 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 isolation It's really isolating. Um, probably hence one of the reasons why I remain stealth for such a long time, um, because there just isn't visibility here. Um, and sort of being the, not necessarily the only one, but the only person to be visible is a really difficult thing. Mm. Um, so yeah, I'm hearing a lot of isolation going on. Um, there is a, there is a young person's charity. Um, that's just opened up in the last couple of years within Peterborough. Um, fantastic, absolutely brilliant. I hear so many young people rave about it. Um, okay. So I'm, I'm really pleased that that's there for the young people. It's now just adult spaces we need to work on. Right. Yeah, and you mentioned you were stealth until recently. I wonder. I wonder if you feel able to talk a little bit about about your experience because I 
I was quite surprised to see, to see to see a Facebook post from you a couple of weeks ago. Sure. Yeah. So um, I hate that it was on social media, but of course. I felt it was it was the only way in which I could come out um, without having to have individual conversations with people. It was just the easiest option that I thought about. Um, so, yeah, I think I chose to be stealth for a long time because that's what I wanted to do. Um, but I think now working with, with trans and GSRD clients, um, I've realized that actually I need to be visible. Um, and particularly with the state of trans rights at the moment, um, I I do need to be visible. Not not just for the younger generation, but but for everybody. Um, I think the the more of us there are, uh, the more we can put it out to the world and say, hey, we are here. We walk amongst you, mm -hmm. even if you don't know it. Right. Um, right. And I think that was the biggest thing for me was obviously I've got friends and work colleagues that I I used to see and work with who. I talk to a lot of the time, but they have no idea about that part of my life. Sure. Um, and and how has that been received? Yeah, it's all been really positive, actually. Okay, um, good. All been uh, there have been one or two comments on LinkedIn, which are to be expected. Um, the professional networking <laughs> channel. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. But you, you see a lot of it on LinkedIn. Um, but yeah, generally speaking, personally, it's all it's all been really positive and supportive. It's been quite overwhelming. Mm. Um, but I think that the proof will be sort of if people treat you any differently. Mm. Yeah. But yeah. I've now built up a network and good support system um, that I'm able to deal with that should it happen. Yeah, you're not going to be knocked back by one or two people. Yeah. Being mean because you 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 are now much more supported in your identity and much more robust. Um, it sounds like. And how how was your wife's? What was your wife's view of you doing this? Because I'm sure you would have had a big conversation about this. We did. Yeah. We uh, we generally uh, have deep meaningful conversations in our hot tub, uh, uh -huh. which is where it happened. Good place. Uh, so, <laughs> so I asked her, "What do you think?" And uh, as as she always does, she said to me, "Do what you feel you need to do. Why now?" Mm. Um, and I gave her the reasons that I've just given you, but I also said I understand myself so much more now in terms of minority stress. Mm. Um, and I fear if I don't do this, then there will be consequences for me later down the line, um, which. I didn't recognise until sort of the last couple of years once we were doing the course um, mm. and it was almost textbook for me. I thought, okay, this makes sense now, this fits. That concealment, it's it's hard. It's really hard to sort of carry it's that. It's a big cost. It comes with a big yeah. cost. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, she she completely understood that. Um, it's a do what you need to do. But of course there are implications for her. Um, mm. So I yeah. wanted to exactly. check it out. But yeah, she's very supportive. So, and has how's the, has there been any impact on her from from other people that you're aware of? Not that I'm aware of. Um, so, she works with people that I know because I deliver some training there as well. Mm -hmm. um, and generally, it's been quite supportive. Um, I think she's basically just said to people, "If you've got any questions, just ask me." Right. Just be open and honest. That's mm -hmm. all we can ask. Well, yeah, and that those questions are, may well lead to other people recognizing their their own discomfort with their gender yeah. too. And um, so it's it's good that that channel can exist, really. Yeah, and I think it does. It adds a lot of credibility to you as a trainer and as a professional that you can talk from lived experience, not just clinical experience, because so long we've had a history of clinicians talking about us from their from the experience they learn in the room mm -hmm. and they they actually they, they go away and have a very different and live a very different life and they they don't they don't uh, walk the walk as well as talking the talk absolutely yeah so what are, what are some of the challenges currently 
facing your community, your clients? Mm -hmm. So I think just existing right now mm. is hard for trans people. Um, obviously, as we know, trans rights are being scrutinised left, right and centre. Um, what rights? Really? Well, particularly, you know, exactly, yeah, exactly. Mm. What rights? Um, I think the conversion therapy ban is just, it's just dreadful. Um, I can't use the words that I would like to on here. Uh, but <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. But it, but it, there is a complete nonsense to how a therapist can, could, is, is expected to work with one aspect of someone's experience and not address the other. I don't know. I don't know how I could do therapy without talking mm -hmm. about gender as well as sexuality. It just doesn't make sense. Yeah, exactly. Um, it's, it's a, it is a worrying time, isn't it? When we think of actually, how is this going to affect our personal lives? How is it going to affect mm -hmm. our professional lives as well in the therapy room? Yeah. Um, and that's something that gets brought into the room a lot with trans clients as well. Mm -hmm. It's very much at the forefront of everybody's minds right now. And it's something that they carry with them into the room and outside of the room as well. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I think, you should, like I say, just existing right now is, is really tough. Um, I think over the last few years as well, with all the media bashing towards trans people, all the TERFs out there, um, although there have been one or two people that have said, you know, all, although this is horrible, it's raising trans profiles. People know who trans people are now. Yeah, that's Whereas, true. you know, a few years ago, people didn't really know what it was, mm. or at least they didn't know what it was in Peterborough anyway. Um, so I suppose that's a positive from mm. it. But yeah, there's there's just so much scrutiny and pathologization as well. Um, and what I find is a lot of clients come to me and say, I've had therapy with another therapist, but they just didn't get it. Or mm. they said, I'm like this because of this. So mm -hmm. there's so, so many referrals I get saying that. Mm. Um, and then also some of the older queer clients that I see find it, ha, have been fi finding it difficult to fit into the queer culture now because it's mm. changed so, so much. Right. Right. and still continuing to change and evolve, uh, there's almost a, well, where do I fit into this? So like older trans clients, you mean, in particular? Yeah, trans, or... gay, lesbian, mm -hmm. yeah, just GSRD in general. Um, it's changing very rapidly, the world, isn't it, I think? Yeah. I was at Trans Pride in Brighton a couple of weeks ago, and I was amazed by the number of young confident young people wandering around proclaiming their their gender expression however they're choosing and just with so much so much energy and so much pride uh, in in the little park where we're having the picnic afterwards i mean it's just joyful absolutely mm -hmm. joyful and and i felt very envious that they they've had that experience and i mean i hid in the closet till i was 21 and just still didn't find it a safe place to come out as a gay man. Mm. And and there, um, I mean, back then, homosexuality was still illegal until you were 21. Sure. Um, but it was just weird to see how, how the generational shifts are, these kind of cohort effects as a different generation experiences our community and identities similar to ours, adjacent to ours, but in a different way. Uh, that's yeah. quite exciting, really. Absolutely. And and actually, some of my clients do say, um, I feel a bit envious of the younger generation because mm -hmm. although I'm really pleased for them that they, you know, they get to be who they are, actually, I didn't experience that. Mm -hmm. And they don't have to experience the, some of the stuff that I went through. Um, yeah, I, I, I think I, I have a, I can relate to that, and then I also think I would not want to be a young trans kid now. No, <clears throat> coming absolutely to, not coming to recognise that level of difference and realising how everybody else is, <laughs> not everybody else, but how society is vociferously condemning that. I mean, it it was better when they didn't say anything than what they're getting now, like. That when when society didn't really know 
than it, than yeah. it is now. I think so. I really admire their their resilience and courage to be to be true to themselves. Mm. Yeah, because I don't think it's. I mean, I'm envious, and I wouldn't want their life. No, absolutely not. And actually, um, I kind of count my lucky stars in a way that I am the age that I am now. Uh, in terms of, uh, and I transitioned so young um, that I I got to do that. I got to do the medical transition quite quickly in comparison to today's mm-hmm. standards. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm certainly grateful for that. Right. All right. Moving on. Um, what are you passionate about? What What's Nathan passionate about? Apart from hot tubs, <laughs> deep conversations in hot tubs, which sounds like a very good thing to be passionate about. <laughs> That is a good question. Um, I would say probably social justice in all aspects, um, but particularly for GSRD people, people of colour, neurodiverse people and marginalised communities. And I Mm -hmm. think actually that's always been at my core ever since Mm -hmm. I can remember. Mm -hmm. I always used to sort of try and... Uh, get justice for somebody that was being bullied at school, you know, right. all that kind of stuff. Um, so it's it's always been part of who I am. Um, but I think now I'm quite passionate about educating people mm-hmm. about this stuff. Hopefully just planting little seeds. Mm. Um, I don't want to be patronising to anybody, but just planting little seeds and hopefully, um, you know, change will happen. Mm. So I wouldn't necessarily call myself an activist as such, um, but <laughs> I promote change where I can. Some people may say I'm an activist, some might not, but, you know, I try and promote change where I can. So, And anyone committed to social justice is, is an activist, really, sure. I think. And I don't think you can do GSRD therapy without, without social justice being the the first tenet, really. Yeah. I mean, we're standing on the shoulders of feminists and of blacks, of black activists that came before us and therapists who have kind of made that clear that there has to be equality and, mm-hmm. um, and understanding of difference. Um, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Any, any other passions you want to talk about? You, you can confess to the world. <laughs> Um, I've been so I think I'm so focused on work but I think actually one of the biggest things for me particularly the past two years what I found is because this work is so heavy Mm -hmm. I love it and I couldn't imagine doing anything else but it is heavy Um, I have really tried to uh, make changes to my own life in terms of my well-being Mm -hmm. um so yeah passionate just about self-care in general because how can we how can we give our best to our clients when we're not okay so um yeah there's been a a few personal changes uh in terms of work-life balance um so i like to explore nature go on breaks things like that when i can Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah i saw that you were on holiday in the same in the same tiny little town that i'd never even heard of that that Rick M. Davis was that was the other day. I was like, within days of each other, you were both yeah. in this place. Yeah, I think within twenty four hours, it was wow. really weird. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Yes. It, it's quite interesting because um, obviously, where we went. Um, was Should we let's just say where? Yeah, let's just yeah. say where it was. It was uh, it was where Sex Education was filmed. It was a, a little place called Simmons Yacht, right on the border of Wales. Um, and when I watched sex, ed- sex Education, I said to my wife, I want to go there. That looks amazing. I need to go there. <laughs> Little did we know when we got there last week, it was literally there. Wow. Wow. Yeah. And there's such an amazing house. Yeah. Incredible house. Yeah. 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 Just uh, the views from there are amazing. We did uh, we did want to go inside, but it's all, it's all closed off. So. So is that a private house or? Yes, private. You can, I believe you can rent it out for a, quite a pretty penny. Like an Airbnb uh, or something. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Right. You'd need to have a big group for that though, really, wouldn't you, I think? Because it's quite yes. a big place. Yeah. 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 
Good. Well, I look, I'm looking forward to that next series of, um, of sex education coming out. It's yeah. a very good program, I think. That's brilliant. Tell me what motivated you to get in touch and undertake our program all those years ago. So I always knew that I wanted to work with particularly trans clients, but LGBT plus in general. Mm. Um, and I did some research and they're just... I think yours was the first that came up. Pink therapy was the first thing that came up and it just instantly grabbed me. Um, and I certainly couldn't find anything else like it. Mm. Um, and I thought, I'm yeah. not sure that there is much else. There's something in America that's similar, but shorter and very differently structured. But And that's yeah. it, isn't it? I think a lot of what I saw were just sort of short CPDs and that just mm. didn't feel enough for me. Mm. Um, and I thought if I'm going to do this work, I need to be wholly invested in it. Lived mm. experience isn't enough. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, that's kind of what grabbed me. And then uh, I think COVID again was kind of had a lot to do with it because we were due to go on holiday. It didn't happen. And and I had the money for the course then. Uh, so it was it ended up being quite a last minute thing, um, which I'm I'm just so grateful for. And I'm grateful mm. for doing it when I did because of the people that were on it as well. Mm -hmm. Um so yeah, that's kind of what motivated me. I think mm. my work's always gone in that direction anyway, even when I was with the police, I was a hate crime champion. Um, mm. I was part of the LGBTQ network within the police as an ally at the time. Mm -hmm. um, so my work has always gone in that direction anyway. It just kind of made sense for me to do it. For sure, for sure. And what's been the most interesting part of it for you, if you can pick, if you can pick one? I don't know. That's tough. Uh, you can pick one more than one if you need to. But. In terms of modules? Yeah, or... In terms of, yeah, either the modules or, or the way the course is structured, really. Yeah. I think um, it's a, it's a, whenever I try to explain it to people, I just don't do it justice because I think until you're in it, you don't realise how special it is. Um, I think I can't pinpoint one thing specifically in terms of the structure or anything, but I, I think it just provides people with probably the safest space I've ever felt in, um, which for me has been the most important thing. And I mm. think if it, if it wasn't for that, then perhaps I wouldn't be in the position that I'm in today. Um, so, yeah, I can't pinpoint one thing specifically, but just just the whole programme, the people that are on it, um, the, the faculty, everybody. Um, but if I had to choose a module... Mm. I would say from the foundation, I would say probably intersectionality. Mm -hmm. um, I found that the most interesting, the most that sort of grabbed me. Um, and it's kind of, it's informed how I work now. Mm. Um, but but the one I'm, I am looking forward to uh, this year is autism. I'm really excited about that one. Okay, cool. Yeah, that's one of our new modules. Yeah. That's um, written by one of our previous graduates, so that's that's rather cool to be to be able to take their experience that they're from the the work that they've been doing outside the course and how they've integrated the two to create to create new work for us. Yeah, that's fair. Um, and how has it changed your practice? You mentioned intersectionality there, so I guess that's that's one of the one of the lenses in which you're now working through yeah yeah definitely yeah it's 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 informed my approach um by acknowledging all of my clients intersections uh, looking at their privileges as well as, well as mm -hmm. marginalized identity um where they feel they fit in the world that kind of thing um mm. and it yeah it's it's really changed the way that i work in such a different it's just brilliant the way that it flows with some clients they just get it um and just the, the subtle things that can happen when you bring it into the room. Um, and of course, not just client work, but I've started delivering training based on privilege now as well. Right. Um, just because I think um, because of my intersectional identity, I related to it so much. 
mm. um, you know, the different the different layers that you have. Um, and because it's something that I feel so passionate about, I want to be able to deliver that to other people as well. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Um, recommend me a book or a film because I'm always learning as much from my students as I am in any way part imparting knowledge and experiences. Sure. Okay. So um, I have a book and a film. Oh, both. Um, okay. Yeah. Fab. Thank you. So most of the books that I have, you probably already know about or have anyway, but I've chosen this one. Uh, it's called Top to Bottom. Right. Uh, by Finley Games. Um, uh-huh. And it's obviously not a therapy book in any way, but it's about uh, this guy. He's a, a trans guy uh, and it's a, his personal journey to going through phalloplasty um and it uh yeah really resonated with me in a lot of ways um Mm -hmm. and i i do if clients are thinking about phalloplasty or bottom surgery i say you know take a look at this book obviously it's just one person's experience but have a read of it um Mm -hmm. so that's the book that i recommend Thank, thank you for that yeah it's it's one that i've seen around and i keep thinking i ought to buy that book i ought to get that so i'll take your I'll take your advice and get the book. Sure. Good. Okay. Let me know what you think. For sure. And your film? And the film. So the film is called Anything's Possible. um, And Billy Porter has directed it. Oh, wonderful. It's, uh, it's, I think it's probably less than a week old now. Um, Just been released on Amazon. Um, And it's, it's a a rom-com. Um, Mm -hmm. but it's about a a trans girl um, just navigating her way through love, high school, that kind of thing. Um, Mm -hmm. And she enters into a relationship with this guy. But also what I really love about it is uh, a lot of the main cast are people of colour as well. Um, So it feels like a real, just, yeah, just a, a film that feels really pioneering um, and first of its kind. And uh, yeah, I watched it and thought, wow, I, there was nothing like this back when I was growing up. It just wasn't a thing. Um, incredible. Incredible. So, yeah. And I'm really pleased it's on Amazon because I'm, I, it seems I can stay, stay home and watch it. Which exactly. Is, which is yeah. very comfortable yeah. uh, than going out and sitting in a drafty cinema. Um <laughs> With everybody else eating and talking through the films, I find oh. it so annoying. All right, and um, as I'm a fairy, I'm allowed to give grant wishes. Okay. So I'm going to give you three wishes. What are you going to wish for? Okay. Um, so my first wish, which I I think I put it on my post a couple of weeks ago, was that I wish that we didn't have to come out. Mm-hmm. Um. I appreciate for trans folks, you kind of have to do that um, in terms of, you know, if you want to transition and stuff. But generally speaking, I just wish that nobody had to face the fear of coming out and going through that process. Um, I want the world to be in a place where, you know, if somebody comes home and they say, this is my girlfriend, my boyfriend or, or whoever, and my partner, and just for it to be accepted, not this big coming out process. Right. Um, so that's my first wish. Mm-hmm. My second one, I imagine probably quite cliche, but just to end all prejudice, all homophobia, biphobia, transphobia, racism, all of it, just get rid of it. Mm-hmm. Because until you've experienced it, you have no idea of the amount of damage that it causes somebody. Right. Um, I just just, mm. just want just, it gone. But. Just be kind, everyone. E- exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Just be kind. It's yeah. Like, it's, all, it's not hard. Yeah. Exactly. Mm. You don't have to understand everything. Just respect yeah. people. Right. And so that's my third? second one. And my third, I wish that everybody could see their self through the lens of the person that loves them the most. Mm. Because. You know, I think most people have a hard time seeing their self, mm. seeing their self in a positive light. Um, you know, particularly with clients that we work with, um, it can be quite difficult for them. Mm-hmm. Um, 
And yeah, if I could, even just for the night, a bit like Cinderella or something, just mm -hmm. give them the lens of the person that loves them the most. That's lovely. That's really beautiful. Thank you. Well, thanks very much for joining me today. And um, I've, I've really appreciated our conversation and, and seeing you blossom and grow over the last couple of years. It's been, it's been a privilege to, to witness and to be part of. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thanks very much. Thank you for listening to this podcast. Please click like and subscribe to hear when the next one is released. If you're a therapist looking to enhance your knowledge and skills with GSRD clients, please check out our training website, pinktherapy.org. We run one and two year specialist training programs online, as well as offer a wide range of short CPD modules. Thanks again for listening to On Becoming a GSRD Therapist.